I'd like to welcome you to the AGM of the Cambridge and Essex branch of Butterfly Conservation. Do we have any apologies for absence? Because I don't believe I've actually received any myself. Okay, well, that sounds to be pretty good. Um, Sorry, Mike, I was just unmuting. There was someone emailed in um, but to say she couldn't make it. Celia Upchurch. So okay. that came in on the general email. Right. Okay. Right. We can um, move on from there to the minutes of the uh, previous meeting. Can people see that? Can people see the minutes? Yeah. Okay, so um, we can see from the minutes that this is in fact our, our second virtual AGM. Um, last year, um, as you can see, the numbers peaked at 88, which I think was probably a record for um, AGMs of the branch. Um, and the details of what went on are there. Does anybody have any comments about what we have written? Okay, if there are no comments on these minutes, then can we accept them as a record of what went on? Say aye. I would say yes. Jolly yep, good. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. That allows us then to move back to the agenda. When um, if there are, we have a we have a, an item matters arising. I mean, if anybody has anything they want to follow up from those minutes. I think there'll be one or two threads which will be picked up um, later in the meeting, but um, nobody has anything um, they wish to add to that. Then we shall progress very well to the next item. I'm conscious that you're probably not seeing the light screen. Have you got the agenda back up for in front of you? Everybody seeing the agenda? Yep, it's yep. there. Yes, okay, you. so the next item on the agenda is the chairman's report. So that's that's me. Um, and I think I would say that um, outside of the uh, big butterfly count, probably the major event uh, of the year for butterfly conservation has been the launch of the five-year strategy by our chief, exec chief executive, Julie Williams. This is an attempt to revitalize the society following the difficulties experienced during the pandemic when people stopped doing anything and income fell. Um, and she's essentially wishing to overhaul the society. Um, so that we uh, 
we perform better. And she's going to introduce um, clear objectives and indeed also um, the tools by which those objectives can be actually assessed. This is sort of a, an inevitable um, result of the digital age, I suppose. So um, I'm sure we'll hear a lot more of that um, in the months to come. Um, but on a more parochial level, um, it was this year extremely nice to be able to get out and enjoy our wildlife, which was despite the best efforts of the climate, probably, because it, it wasn't a particularly good year for weather. But um, we were able to um, get out and we were able to resume our uh, conservation operations. The committee has also evolved as it usually does this year. Um, Rob Guy, our treasurer, moved on and uh, has been replaced by, by Sarah, Sarah von Blumenthal, who uh, will be uh, presenting next. So welcome to your first AGM, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And another addition to the committee is um, Joe Yorker, who has um, accepted the mantle of Essex Conservation. So uh, we're very pleased about that because this is a post that's been um, open for a few years. And I know that Rob Smith will be particularly pleased to have some help in Essex. Um, and indeed it gets better because he's also got help from uh, Keith Winch in looking after the Essex transects. So uh, this, is, this is quite good news. Um, now, we've also lost another member. Uh, Rachel Barber, our membership officer, has left us uh, a couple of months ago. And um, this again brings me to our, my annual appeal for help um, because this is an important permission uh, can, uh, uh, job that we need to fulfil on the committee. So anyone who would like to be membership officer, please get in touch and we'll explain what's involved and you can see whether you like to do it. But um, it is um, something that we, we, we are anxious to fill. So that's um, my um, summary of what's gone on this year. Does anybody have any questions they might want to ask? Okay, I can't see any waving hands or anybody anxious to say anything. So that means we can move on to the treasurer's report. Sarah, are you with us? I am with you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Splendid. Uh, okay, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, so just bear with me. Ah, I think Mike, um, you're the only person who can who can display um, display slides. If you, if you could uh, open up the slides, that would be marvellous. Okay, there might be a slight delay here because I don't have that organised there. Um, on your email. Um, okay, so that is them. We can share that. Marvellous. Well, that is what you wanted us to say. That, yes, that's right. <laughs> it's really just the first three slides, Mike. So um, that, that's just the the um, the header. So if you could move to the next one, which is where um, the the income expenses for the year are. That's marvellous. Thank you. Can everybody see that? Um, is it big enough? Hopefully it's big enough. Um, I'm gonna, I'll talk you through the um, through the, the main numbers here, the big numbers. Um, but for any anybody who's new to um, to the brand, just just to let you know that uh, we follow um, the main charities financial year, 
um, and that runs from April to March every year. Um, and so these accounts are effective at the end of March 2021. Um, and, and what drives our, our, our budget, um, um, our spend, is, is really mostly the subscriber numbers, the membership is what gives us um, the main income. Um, we have received um, donations in the past, um, but this year, this year that we're financially that we're reviewing, um, we didn't have any. Um, but looking at the income, the subscription um, income, the membership was up again um, on the prior year. It was um, 6% higher um, at a total of £8,234. Um, so that was the incoming amount um, in the year. Then looking at expenditure, uh, if I just focus on the big numbers here, um, £3,000 um, you'll see there against fundraising and publicity, grants and donations outwards. That was sponsorship of a PhD, um, the same amount as the previous year, um, because this represented the final contribution to that, to that PhD um, studentship. Um, further down, spend on consultants and conservation was a little bit higher than the previous year, 1500. Um, but the, but the really the big area of spend for us in the year was on the newsletter and postage. Um, this was quite a lot higher and this was because of COVID and having to outsource production of the, of the materials um, out, out to a, a third party. Um, whereas previously, my understanding is that that was done in-house, as it were, by head office. Um, so there was some impact of, of COVID there. Um, then other than that, really, there were some small savings on, um, on field, field equipment and um, training um, and AGM costs. So, so they're the sort of the big items of spend um, in the year. Total expenses of 11.4 thousand, um, which is a bit higher, obviously, um, than the previous year by, by a couple of um, thousand. If you go on to the next slide, Mike, we'll just see how that plays out in our, in our funds, our cash situation. So you can see there, we've, we brought forward our opening balance for the year was 11 and a half thousand. Um, and and, and there's, there you can see the, the income that we talked about, the 8,234 incoming, and then the outgoing amount of the expenses of 11,400. So the overall impact of that is that our balance has reduced by um, just over £3,000. Um, so our, our, our closing balance for the year was 8335 And that's due to slightly lower income and then the increased expenses. So it's a bit of a, a double whammy there. Looking forward, um, I mean, it's, I think it's the same comment as last year in that we've got the commitment to paying um, £6,000 to big city butterflies. Um, so that's staggered over, over a, a several years. The first payment happen, is happening in this current financial year. So we'll see that first payment coming through at the next AGM. Otherwise, I think that's, I mean, that it's a pretty straightforward um, review. Um, I'm happy to take any questions and try to answer them um, as best I can if you have any. Um, I may not have the detailed knowledge because I've been picking these up during the year, but happy to, to um, field any, any questions you might have. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for a very concise um, presentation of the accounts. Uh, does anyone have a question? Can't see any waving hands. Yes, Maybe. Jack Harris. Jack, can you? Un you're muted at the moment. Can you unmute yourself, Jack? Jack, can't hear you, I'm afraid. Try that. Oh, try that. Try yeah, that. Go, yeah, go again. <laughs> you can hear me now. Um, yeah. uh, I see there's a lot of the expenditure is on uh, sending out the newsletters, which I enjoy. I enjoy reading them. But uh, how much would be saved if we uh, 
went down purely electronic distribution of uh, newsletters. Could I ask um, for maybe Brian to, to, to input here? Um, in truth, I don't know what the actual costs of the um, of the of the um, the digital version would be, and whether there is there are design costs um, involved with that. Is Brian is Brian on the, on the <coughs> call, Mike, that he could give some input onto onto that? Uh, hi, hello, uh, I, I'm, I'm too Brian, deaf to hear that easily. <laughs> I, I, I don't think Brian's in the meeting, but uh, it's Vince oh, here. Um, hi, Vince. Thank you. Uh, I think Brian does all the layout himself, so it would have essentially be zero cost if um, okay he didn't post them out. <laughs> so yes, it would save a huge amount of money. Yeah. However, I think it's normally about 60, 70 percent of members who've provided an email address. But uh, yeah, I should make the point that uh, that certainly from from head office, there's definitely a, a drive towards becoming more digital. Um, so it's something that I think we will we will need to address and have to take a closer look at. Um, but clearly, the costs for the financial year we're reviewing were were really very much higher than, than I think anybody would want them to have been. Um, and it's something we're looking at in the current year. Um, but I mean, I think it's a good point about about moving further towards digital. Um, well, I was, for example, in the past, you know, had such a poor internet connection, I had to use satellite, but I've now got a decent uh, fast broadband and uh, that's made a terrific difference. And uh, previously I was against this idea of uh, electronic uh, information for the uh, newsletters, but now because of my change circumstances, I'm quite happy. And there may well be others in the same sort of position. It's good to hear. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I'm sure that you're, you're reflecting a changing situation but uh, as you as you state in the past this has been quite controversial because people have, have been very keen on getting a, a hard copy um but for some but we do have this problem of not actually having contacts for all the members um so that that's a real problem in going totally digital that there's you know if louise has got the right figure it's 40 percent of the people wouldn't get a newsletter hmm. So, you know, it, it is something which will happen eventually. It'll go more digital. But at the moment, we're, we're limited somewhat. And yes, we, we are aware of the, of the high cost there. And it's something that uh, we will seek to control. OK, can, can I propose that we accept these accounts? Um, and can we have a second second that? Yeah, seconded. Thank you, Rob. Oh. So can we, do, does the meeting accept these accounts? Yes. 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 Can't hear any dissension. So we'll uh, take it that the accounts have been accepted, which means we can move on to Item six on our agenda, which is recorders reports. So who would like to go first? Go on, Rob, you're waiting to go, aren't you? No, <laughs> well, it's not just that. I'm, I'm not sure Ed's in the meeting at the moment, but um, oh, no, I'll go first and uh, hopefully Ed can join us shortly. Uh, I'll start in the winter, obviously. Uh, the five adult hibernator species were recorded in early February, so we got off to a, a good start, but then uh, spring was late and uh, cold, um, and uh, recording was difficult uh, in um, uh, during sort of April and, and part of May, uh, but when conditions were good enough, uh, the smaller meadow species like small copper and small heath I thought were easy to come by, um, and the wall brown had a, a good first brood as well, uh, with several sightings in the Langdon Hills, which is particularly notable, uh, and also uh, a first sighting at Thorndon Park, uh, Brentwood, uh, first since uh, 1993. Um, then into mid-spring, uh, the Griddle Skipper um, remains limited to uh, two meadows in One Tree Hill Country Park at Langdon. Uh, we still haven't seen it at um, Willow Park. Park for five years now. Um, but this year I tried a, a photographic 
study. Um, I mean, both with my photos and, and digital photos are, are so good now, you can look at the markings and, um, and ascertain individuals, uh, individual butterflies. And I found uh, 12 individual butterflies. Uh, there were a couple of males were recorded twice, um, just, just two days apart. So because they're busy, I, maybe they don't last that long, I don't know. But uh, one female was photographed four times over a period of, of 12 days. So, so that was encouraging. But then we only got, uh, we only photographed three uh, females uh, and none, none were recorded uh, in, you know, moving from one field to the other. So, um, but it's, it's such a small uh, total that it's difficult to draw conclusions uh, over. Uh, moving into June, uh, the heath fertility counts were, were very good. Um, they seem pretty stable, although a bit concerned about Hadley Great Wood uh, and the management there that we hope to get in there again this year. There was the peak count there was 75. At Poundwood, it was 120. And Hockley Woods rose again up to 146, although someone had an estimated count of about 200. So that those three sites are looking good. Um, because the season uh, wasn't, you know, steady heat all the way through and was quite protect, protracted, um, it meant that the white letter hair streak uh, males were seen clashing for, for several weeks. So um, I certainly took advantage of that and, and recorded them in, in several sites. Um, so that was good to see. Uh, but the summer itself was particularly noteworthy for the nymphalids, uh, especially the Red Admiral. They were very plentiful and the, the peacock was in good numbers, but uh, they all seemed to do well. Uh, I wonder whether the, the wet weather was good for them. I, yeah, I don't know whether, whether that was because the, the nettles were, were lush or um, perhaps it wasn't so good for their, their parasites. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, the high rainfall was certainly good for uh, grass growth, uh, which may have explained the poor showing of some of the smaller meadow species in the summer brood, especially the, the common brood, uh, blue. Um, I don't know, I was waiting for that to take off, but it, it just, just petered out, really. Uh, I think the ringlet had another poor year. Uh, that may have been the result of dry glaying conditions last year, but um, yeah, it wasn't quite as bad as last year, but uh, nearly. Um, in terms of unusual sightings, there was a large tortoise shell photographed in a garden in Romford, uh, and then uh, Martin Haywood, who I think is here, he had a, a female wall brown in his Roxwell garden, which is west of Chelmsford. I mean, that is a fantastic inland sighting, very encouraging. Uh, and there was a dark green fertility on the south side of, of Colchester. So, and we did have one at Tiptree a couple of years ago. Whether there's something going on in that area, I don't know, but um, that's that's all interesting. There's certainly uh, making progress in other parts of the country. Um, on to some regional projects and consultations. Uh, got the big city butterflies um, project in, in the London boroughs. And there's now two full-time project officers working on that. Uh, One does engagement and the other conservation. Um, we're also involved with the Havering Wildlife Partnership. That's one of the London boroughs, and we're helping to review the their sinks, which is the London version of the local wildlife site. So if anyone's got any information on, on them in the Haven area, please let me know. Uh, we've also fen fended off uh, some tree planting schemes on some good grass and sites. Uh, that, that's a bit of a concern to, to me in particular. Um, I'm a bit anxious about this new Essex Forest Initiative and where trees are going to be planted. Uh, on the more positive side, um, we attend the Epping Forest Consultation Group and are pleased to report an expansion of their grazing regime uh, into Wanstead Flats. Uh, so that hasn't happened for, for some years. 
Uh, and then as with last year, I've been heavily involved with the Middlewick Ranges site in Colchester, um, which unfortunately looks as if it's going into the local plan for uh, a thousand homes. But we're, we're fighting all the way on that one. Uh, about uh, earlier in the year, I updated the, the Essex Red data list. But maybe I should have done um, 10 years ago uh, when the, the national review took place. Uh, I've added the, the wall brown, unsurprisingly. Also, the, the small heath because of its near threatened uh, national status. And the purple emperor moved from the appendix into the main, main area because that's now extant in the whole of the county. And also I did the white letter hair streak because it's because of its endangered status. And I've removed the marble white and the silver wash for Tillery because um, they're doing particularly well. If not, they're found quite everywhere. I just mentioned moths because we, we do do moths as well. Uh, Fisher's Estuarine Moth Surveys. Um, last year we recorded uh, 42 at uh, Beaumont Quay, uh, which was a, a new record. And then this year we surpassed that with 61. So something great is happening there, hopefully the, the management. Uh, and if you want more information uh, on moths, thoroughly recommend the, the Facebook group, the Essex Moth Group. There's a lot of um, input there you know, like uh, the colonisation of the, um, the Clifton non Uh Yeah, very, very, uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, very, very pleased uh, with the new additions to the uh, team, uh, particularly Joe Yarker uh, on conservation. Uh, and then uh, Keith Winch is, uh, has taken on the role of transect. So that helps me a lot. And I'm, I've also um, we just recruited Gabby, Gabby Crisp, uh, who's going to help uh, some, with some uh, recording duties and some eye record verification. So that's a tremendous help to me. Uh, thanks to all of you who submitted to the branch sightings page and, uh, and have emailed me uh, their spreadsheets. Um, uh, fantastic. Thank you. Uh, last year, I've only just completed the 2020 records, to be honest, uh, but we got over 27,000 for Essex. So there's a few thousand Essex sightings on the branch sightings page and sort of 10 to 15,000 on transects and the rest um, a real mixture. A uh, big thank you to um, Tony Roberts as well, who transcribes all of the uh, branch uh, sightings. It's a tremendous effort yet again. Uh, that's me done. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Um, yeah. Has Ed joined us? Hi, Mike. Yes, I'm here now. Ah, excellent. Impeccable timing slash half an hour late. <laughs> right, okay. Well, as you might realise, we're on recorders reports and yep. Rob has just finished. So over to Cambridge. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, thanks for that, uh, Rob. Um, gave me a few little pointers to a couple of things that I'll talk about. Um, so I'll just give a sort of a, a, a sort of a, a, a bit of an overview, um, and then I'll just give a few little highlights on um, various particular species of note, uh, positive uh, or negative um, from the last 2021, really. Um, a little quick recap back to 2020, um, compiling the reports. So both Rob and I, we compile the reports for the whole uh, county, and then we send them up to uh, to the mothership down in Dorset to, to compile them all. So the 2020 results were actually far and away the biggest data set that um, Cambridge uh, butterfly recording. So it's sort of three vice counties, Cambridge, uh, Huntingdonshire, and the sort of Peterborough, North, uh, practically Northampton type of area far and away the greatest number of records that we've ever submitted. So it was very satisfying. I think there was definite lockdown effect there for butterflies coming in. So far to date this year, um, I've got in the region of 6,000 records through iRecord and the branch sighting, which is a little bit down on this equivalent stage last year. Now, later in the year, we get a big uh, data download from, um, from HQ, the transit records and a few others. So that will bump it up, but it won't be, I don't think it's going to hit the 12,000 last year, but it's still on a par with 
previous years. So it's going really well. And thanks everybody for continuing to submit records in whichever way um, you do. I'm getting some records in through Twitter now. There's all sorts of different access, uh, ways of getting records. Um, there's a new, <coughs> uh, the new app came out this year, um, which some people really thought was an improvement, some people struggled with, but um, I think iRecord is, is a really great way of getting records to us as well. So thank you for that. Um, Whilst we spend most of our time talking about butterflies at these AGMs, uh, Rob did right point out BC does cover moths as well. Also launched this year for Cambridgeshire Vice County, so excluding Huntingdonshire and the northern bits, um, was a new CAMS moths site, um, which is excellent. So those moths amongst you, if you don't know of the CAMS moth site, do look it up. Um, it's a really good way of, of, of getting your moth records um, submitted. Um, so a little bit of a look at the year in butterflies. Obviously, we had um, an, another surprising year weather-wise, which uh, has its impact on the butterflies. Um, so starting at the beginning of the year with the skippers, so the dingy skipper and the, and the grizzled skipper obviously are interesting in May. Um, the dingy skippers had a pretty good year by the looks of things. The, the, the devil dyke population in South Cams um, had nice numbers. Um, and then our sort of nice cluster of sites for grizzled and dingy skippers through to Huntingdonshire and to North Cambridgeshire. Um, both had pretty good years holding on, maybe a bit better. I don't, I'm not 100% sure that we went to what the transects say. Um, grizzled skipper was holding on, had been holding on at just the one site in South Cams, um, over cutting just to the north uh, west of Cambridge. Waiting to see, may still get a record in, but unfortunately no records at all this year. I went out to the site and it's, um, it may not be that favourable anymore, so um, we'll wait and see what happens last next year. But that might be a, a sad loss for for southern Cambridgeshire. Um, there may be other grizzled skippers holding on elsewhere in southern Cams that we've not located. You know, they may pop up. Um, we do get surprises, but um, we'll wait and see. But it's a good thing they're still doing well in North Cams. Um, then looking at hair streaks, we've had a really good year for hair streaks. I think a combination of factors, genuinely. Um, some of them are doing well, are, are, you know, the speciality there with the black hair streak is, is definitely doing better. It seems to be I, I, um, completely anecdotally, maybe some of the changing weather patterns are favorable for it. Um, there's also greater awareness of hair streaks. I definitely think that is happening. People are knowing better where to look for them. Cambridgeshire bits of Essex are the national stronghold for elms. And so you would accept where the national stronghold for white letter hair streak and elm specialist. And I know several recorders in Cambridgeshire who are getting enthusiastic and very good at going and checking elms. And pretty much anywhere you find an elm now, we're finding white leather hair streaks. So we're getting, I'm getting more and more and more records. Same with green hair streak. I think people are getting better at looking out for them and knowing to look out for them. Uh, ditto purple hair streak. Um, a little thought earlier this year, um, attempted to set a challenge with some of our neighbouring BC branches to see whether or not anyone can see four hair streaks in a day and they get bonus points if they can use it using public transport or a bicycle. Um, I think your best bet is going to be around Monk's Wood and, uh, and um, Wood Walton Marsh. I've got a decent chance you could get uh, a late, late black hair streak um, uh, mixing in with white letter, purple and green. Um, moving on to the blues, small blues continue to hold their ground in Cambridgeshire, possibly uh, in the, the new sites all around Cambridge, the regular sightings again, the colony at Magog Down seems to be growing and spreading. Um, that one cautiously feeling is probably going to be our healthiest and strongest. There's certainly a lot of um, uh, suitable habitat there. So that's that's great and good management. Um, so for, 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 for checking out the small blues, uh, definitely um, we're, we're doing nicely for those for the time being um, it looks like they're getting nicely established in new subpopulations of that broad population are cropping up um, then there's the Adonis Blues on Devil's Dyke who surprisingly showed up at 20, in 2020 we, we, were, we were a bit quiet with the news there because they were uh, um, uh, a little out of range let's say um, and we waited to see whether or not they'd survive the winter. Um, wasn't that cold the winter? So they did. And uh, good numbers, fairly good numbers of the Donis Blue were seen at the first brood sort of May time along Devil's Dyke near the Newmarket race course. And um, I went out there and yeah, they were pretty abundant. They were very flighty that I went. Um, the second brood in August, we only had a couple of individuals seen. Now it might've been 
not many people going out there, might have been the weather, maybe they haven't really properly established um, from however it is that they managed to, uh, to arrive at Devil's Dyke. Um, there are very old sort of 17th, 18th century records of the species from Newmarket Heath, which is essentially Devil's Dyke, um, but nothing newer than that. Um, and obviously there's been a lot of changes. Um, they showed up in equally mysterious circumstances on um, Fairfield Common uh, a couple of years ago. So we wait, we, we can't make any judgments about how they got there or why they got there. We'll wait and see how, much, how many more years they hold on for. Um, the, uh, another interesting, another positive development this year, a continued spread of dark green fritillary. Um, that seems to be spreading particularly along the Devil's Dyke, um, following the, the chalk grassland along there. And they've now been found much further up towards the northern end of the Devil's Dyke. Not originally, we just had a small cluster around um, Newmarket Racecourse End where we, where we do the active management, but now they're spreading more widely. And, and again, I'm kind of hoping, expecting over the next five years, we're gonna see them cropping up at other places like Magog Down, um, maybe some of the, the wetter sites, um, if you've got the right, um, right violets in there. Um, so yeah, so all in all, I think we've had, whilst for the, for the unusual species, the rarer species, um, they're doing well or they're holding on. Uh, wall brown, hard to say. I think we had a low number of records from the regular sites. I do think they're still holding on in small, in, 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 in by the skin of their teeth around Maypole and Kings Dyke Nature is up near Peterborough. Um, I think they're suffering from a lack of reporting effort because not many people like going out to the fens in May and June um, and trudging up and down the dikes. I've got a couple of good reports up there, but anyone else who's, who's around the kind of Maypile, who's washes type of area, um, let me know and we can see if we can get some more systematic look, uh, searches for wall brown. Um, I'd argue that's probably the most threatened butterfly in Cambridgeshire these days. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll echo Rob's um, thanks to everybody for submitting records for Cambridgeshire. Um, it's, it's really great seeing all the records coming in, seeing what's going on. Um, particularly, you know, as it gets busy in the summer, I love logging on to iRecord and seeing uh, what's coming in. So please keep them coming. And uh, yeah, don't hesitate to get in touch with Rob or I through the um, recorder email address that's available on the site. And um, if you want to, to help out or have any tips on where to go for looking for particular species or helping to fill some holes, again, the fence, there's a real positive records from the fence. We don't get a lot of records from up there. So um, yeah, please keep on recording. Um, every record counts. And uh, yeah, roll on 2022. Um, and those orange tips that we all love to see to herald the start of the spring. Okay, no thanks, Ed. Um, uh, are there any burning questions on that? I don't want to dally too long in this part of the agenda, but if anybody's got a burning question on, on, on the records, they'd like to volunteer. Okay, all right, well, thanks to the recorders. The next item is a conservation report. So I'm looking to find Vince to yep, tell yep. us at least about Cambridgeshire. Hello, hello, thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. you're a bit quiet. Got it. No, okay, I'll get it in there. <laughs> right, good, we're on the sofa here. So trying to fit two people to watching. Okay, um, so yeah, very briefly, just for Cambridgeshire, Although, uh, uh, as uh, Mike mentioned, we're very pleased to welcome Joe to uh, look after Essex, hopefully, going forward. Um, but Cambridgeshire, um, around about the time of the last AGM, we had a bit of work done by Bernard Hunt on the Fleam Dyke that was supported by the branch, um, paying him as a contractor, uh, looking after um, Fleam, the Fleam Dyke's sort of chalky or blue and dark green fertility target species. Um, so Bernard was very effective and um, able to get to parts of the site which would be difficult for us to do as volunteers. Um, so it was sad to hear during 2021 that he retired from his role as a, as a contractor. Um, he not only leaves a hole with us but also other nature conservation work across Cambridgeshire um, as he used to work widely as a contractor for people like the Wildlife Trust and the RSPB. 
Um, and I would say his sort of care and attention to detail in nature conservation stood out compared to um, most contractors who just seem to be in it for the profit, really. So, uh, yeah, we'll have a struggle to replace Bernard's services. Um, and uh, so um, he, you know, he did that work, but our branch really didn't get much done during the pandemic. Um, so we're very grateful to him. And also Aidan Matthews, who's the reserves officer for the Wildlife Trust for Bedfordshire, Cambridge and Northamptonshire. He took on some of the work at Brampton Wood, uh, looking after the black, black hair streaks uh, single-handedly. So uh, thanks to the efforts of both Bernard and Aidan, um, those two sort of key sites had uh, good results for their target species. Fleen Dyke um, in 2021 had the highest ever count of Chalk Hill Blue on transect with an index of 2,600. Uh, the previous peak was 2,200 in 2015. That, that species has been climbing gradually since it colonized the site. And um, at Brampton Wood, we had a count of 66 black hair streaks on the five one hour timed count surveys um, done on June the 23rd by Roger Orbell and Steve Binding. Um, so not as many as 2020 when we had 148, but it was still the sixth best year out of 21 years of survey. So a very good result there. Um, that species seems to continue to climb gradually at Brampton Wood, I think it's doing well. Um, back on the Fleen Dyke, the, the dark green fritillary did not do so well um, this year, um, with just one record, uh, one, one individual on transect, but the green hair streak um, has done well. Um, it was the second best year, and um, a lot of them have crossed the A11 and, and are now more commonly found on the <coughs> south side of the A11, where in the old days, when we started the transect um, over a decade ago, uh, there were never any records of green hair streak in that area. So that's the bit that Bernard and one or two other, um, like Ian Webb from the Wildlife Trust and other volunteers have worked on. Uh, so it's good to see that the, the green hair streak has not only colonised, but actually thrived in that, that area that we've been sort of responsible for. So I did the count on the 27th of May, the, the transit count for that site, and we had 15 green hair streaks uh, well, I had 15 green hair streaks on that day, so the total index was 25. So that was the big proportion of the, the year's butterflies for that species. And 12 of those 15 were on this three sections southeast of the A11, where we work on, where we've done the work. So I think that shows how much our work has helped. But also it contrasts with the area northwest of the A11, which has unfortunately been very poorly managed um, by a Natural England funded scheme, which um, basically they came in with a huge amount of money, cleared masses of scrub, put some sheep fences up and then walked away. So no sheep have ever appeared inside the fences and the scrub has grown back with great vigor and has really negatively impacted the, the butterflies on that area. So not only wasting money, but actually making the site worse by spending lots of money in a short space of time with no follow up which I think we really need to sort of work on. Um, uh, not only Green Hair Street, but also Chalk Hill Blue have suffered as a result of that. And, and we now have far more Chalk Hill Blues on the bit that we look after compared to the bit that Natural England have, did, have trashed. So anyway, there we go. Um, well, anyway, I'm pleased to say that we are now back in the swing of things. And we had a first work, work party in the autumn 2021 um, with a dozen volunteers on the Devil's Dyke, um, cleared lots of scrub, you know, you could really see that we'd missed a year and, and there was lots to do, but um, everyone cracked on and, and we got a good amount cleared. Um, I haven't seen Sharon's transit results yet for this year, but um, a lot of casual reports coming into the website show that it remains a really key site for most of our premium chalk, chalk species. Um, double figure counts of dingy skipper, green hair streak and dark green fritillary, as well as um, the Adonis blue that um, Edwards just mentioned and Chalk Hill blues in their thousands. Absolutely brilliant sight in um, July and August. Um, and uh, the only other thing that we do as conservation really at the moment is um, supporting the checkered skipper work, which Jamie Wildman is going to talk about later. Uh, we contribute financially towards that and also 
many of our members volunteer their survey time looking for uh, checkered skipper and also recording dingy and grizzled skipper in um, the Northamptonshire like forest. So um, I think that really sums up uh, the work for Cambridgeshire and happy to take any questions on that. Even happier if there aren't any. <laughs> Good. I see nothing. Excellent. Right. Well, thank you, Vince. Um, <clears throat> now I'm not. Uh, Joe has only just taken up the uh, the Essex <laughs> position, so I'm not expecting a report from her on Essex, um, where time is getting on. So I don't know whether you want a word, Rob, but. Um, Keep it short, please, if you want if you want to say anything about Essex. I mean, you've already mentioned the, the issues with Middlewich, etc. Is, is uh, I think we can probably leave Essex, can we? Yeah, there weren't any work parties last winter in Essex anyway. Um, no, I don't know if Joe's here, but she has um, emailed me today just to say that uh, she's going to speak to Ian Brown about winter work parties um, at Hadley Greatwood. So that will probably be in January and February, if anyone's interested. Uh, but I think there'll be mail shots uh, going out when we get some dates confirmed. But we, yeah, we've already agreed some, some work previously. We just couldn't do it last winter, but we hope to do it in a couple of months time. Right, thank you, Rob. Um, the next item on the agenda is membership report. Now, as I've already explained, we don't have a membership officer, so we don't, in fact, have a membership report. Um, the last figure we had for membership going back a couple of months ago was 1600, which um, uh, represents a, a steady increase, in fact. So I, I don't know whether we've maintained that, but that was quite a healthy figure uh, at that stage. Um, so the next item, item nine, is communication update. Um, one thing um, I have to contribute there is that um, uh, Rachel Barber, who, as I've already said, has um, left the committee, um, had set up the Facebook uh, group, and um, the uh, the admin of that has now been taken over by by David Chandler. So hopefully that will keep going as a nice place to for people to air their pictures. Um, I'm not sure there's anything, any other news on the communication side, anything from Ian? Um, there's not a huge lot to say uh, other than sort of MailChimp continues to be, I guess, the main avenue of communication directly to members. It seems the quickest. We've got about 1,200 on that mailing list. So just going back to the discussion earlier about sending out the newsletter but that's roughly about 75 percent i think are on have an email contact so it's creeping members. up yeah and um, in, on that subject as well i have uploaded the current newsletter to the website and when i say the website i, I mean the in your area website which is our area on the butterfly conservation website so if anyone wants to have a, have a look at it electronically and or get a copy and send it to somebody else then by all means they can do that you can download it and, and read it as a pdf and the only other bit of news i guess um instagram we've now got an instagram feed which um has it's just over 100 members but hopefully next year we can push it a bit and i think it's um something that people could enjoy and if they you know if you wish by all means submit your photographs of butterflies within our branch area that's the only sort of stipulation i, I put on it is that the, it's um butterflies seen in the branch area at the sort of time of year in which you submit it so the current photos but by all means um please join and follow that instagram feed which off the top of my head is if anyone's on instagram it's it's cams essex bc all lowercase is the um instagram handle or whatever you call it uh that's it i don't have anything else to report unless anyone's got any questions about our communications well, thank you right ah. someone is speaking i 
Hi, Jose. Is tomorrow want to ask a question of, of Ian or anyone else? No? Okay. So the next item on the agenda is committee elections. Um, what, what happens here is that um, we've been working a system whereby a third of the committee retires each year and needs to be re-elected. Um, this gets complicated to work out when you get a changing composition of the, the um, committee over the years. And what this transpires this year is that we need to elect um, Sarah, our new treasurer, Joe, our new um, Essex uh, conservation officer, and then from the existing members of the committee, then um, Guy Manners and David Chandler need to be re-elected. So I would like to propose that we re-elect these four people on block. Do I have a seconder for this? Yep, no seconder. Thank you, Ian. So <laughs> does the meeting want to elect these people? Aye. Yes. Good. Yeah. Splendid. Okay. I take it that means that uh, these people are back and now on the committee formally. And that leads us to any other business. If we can be, we have a few minutes, if we can fit in uh, a little any other business, if anybody wants to raise anything else. I'll just say hello from Scotland. I used to live in Cambridgeshire, but I now live to the east of Inverness. So I'm effectively a country member. Well, that's that's a splendid, um, uh, you know, you'd never have made the AGM if we'd have been ho holding it in deeper Sussex somewhere, would you? <laughs> no, I wouldn't. <laughs> so that's a, a plus for the virtual AGM. I have a feeling this this might be the way we stick with AGMs because we get more people this way. I, I know we're not talking about butterflies up here, but uh, we've now got comma established. Splendid. Good. Okay. Um, anybody else with any other business? I can't see anybody bursting to speak. So that means uh, we have finished the formal part of the AGM.